excuse me for a moment. I need to sit down and have this rather savory meal of rice and <laughs> beef, uh, which I have uh, infused with herbs. <laughs> and will no. This week on backward compatible. Jam, Doc, and Chris continue their series on design decisions by asking when particular video game conventions can help or hurt a game. Plus, Empire's Age of Discovery, ARMS, and the new Netflix series, Castlevania. The MacroCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 106 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hi, everybody. And uh, Doc, do you want to tell us a little bit about what our media discussion is going to be today? No. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, show I, over. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't really have a choice, do I? <laughs> no, you don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this is, this is part two of design decisions, and so... Um, Per my previous rant of uh, what should we forgive, what shouldn't we forgive, uh, we're now going to talk about the idea of conventions versus uh, simulations. In other words, what are we willing to say, you know, that's not realistic? Of course not. It's a game. Because we're telling a story, we're giving an experience, we are uh, immersing uh, players into characters, that kind of a thing. Do we really want it to be a simulation? I think that's a, something we should discuss as well. Well, of course we do, do slash don't. Or do we? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, that's the real question, isn't it? Right. And we will explore that question in our meaty topic. Stay tuned. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including Table Talk. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Let's talk Empires. Age of Empires. Oh, wait. the video game? The video games, right? Well, no. They're awesome. Um, actually, I'm talking about the board game, only it's not called that. It's called Empires, colon, Age of Discovery. Uh, why, you may ask. Go ahead, I ask. Do, just, I do just ask. ask. Why? Yeah. Well, why, I may ask. Simple. Uh, licensing, as it always is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so, who, who owns the, that franchise now, by the way? Is it EA? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of confusing, and, and it's long and drawn out, but basically what it comes down to is, um, you've got the, the creator of the... Uh, the game, the franchise, the whatever, uh, sort of a Sid Meier's type of, of scenario, if you mm-hmm. will. Um, and so as you move on and you try to create new versions of new games, you typically have to, oh, change a thing. Uh, that's why Monopoly uh, keeps being changed and the rules keep getting tweaked. You know, it's because whenever they re-release it, they re-release it with a new thing, a new version, a new whatever. And it keeps the, I, I don't really want to use the word here, but uh, the copyright fresh, if you will. You can't really copyright game mechanics, board game mechanics especially, there is a a long precedent for that. But um, ultimately what it comes down to is when you've got a long pedigree for a game like um, Age of Empires, in this case, Age of Empires 2, the board game, and then let's say uh, an expansion comes out and it's a really great expansion. It's called the Builder's Expansion. And it's so great that you want to just make it part of the game. And so great, in fact, you want to incorporate it into the main rules. And so great, in fact, you want to incorporate it into the board itself that you just go, hey, I know, let's do a Kickstarter and let's rebring it out again. But we don't quite have the rights to, well, everything. So let's rebrand, let's call it a new thing, and let's raise some money and let's go from that perspective. That's exactly what has happened for Empire's Age of Discovery. So... Okay, so what is the setting for this one? Is it like a realistic war setting in the past, like Age of Empires, or is it like Age of Mythology that kind of takes a different sort of fan- fantasy bent? Okay, it's uh, Columbus discovers America. You know the Caribbean is there, and the rest is probably there, but you're not totally sure. Go. And that's what it is. Um, hmm. You have – it's well, it's really worker placement. I'm going to talk mechanics for a minute. It's worker placement. Okay, so you have you have colonists. You have workers, um, and those colonists can be trained to do certain things, like become builders mm-hmm. or become missionaries or become whatever. Okay, right. Um, and what you do is you put your worker, and then the next turn after that, you'll get 
that upgraded worker, and then you place those workers, and some will go discover, be explorers, uh, and, and you, of course, will uh, do the historically correct thing, which is to uh, oppress the natives and take over their land. Right. And I was actually going to ask that question because we are talking about the Caribbean at this particular time in history, and you keep talking about workers. Mm -hmm. Are these, is the assumption here that these are slave workers? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm assuming this game is not meant to make to raise awareness of the slave trade or anything like that. So no. they, they didn't really want to go that route, which no. makes perfect sense. That's they... not its that's not its right. purpose. What its purpose is, is to understand certain elements of history. Like, for example, it's a completely different process to discover a thing than it is to colonize a thing. Uh, completely different. Um, what I like about the game, it's a little bit different from, say, uh, conquest games or that kind of a thing, is that you build an economy as you go, and no one can take that away from you. So if you really focus on, say, silver or gold or rice or any particular thing, sugar, sugar. yeah, yeah. Uh, tobacco, whatever it is, um, it, once you get three trade tokens of that type, you're going to start, instead of earning one Spanish dollar per turn, you're going to earn three because you have a set. A set of anything will give you one. A set of three of a kind will give you three. A set of four of a kind will give you six. So you see how it goes exponential at that point. There's some wild cards, which are ships. Um, you can have merchants, which modify. And really what you got to do when you sit down is to say, I'm going to play this game as a merchant or as a conquistador or as a man who goes in and takes over other people's armies. Uh, you know, you really choose the type of person you want to be. For us, uh, whenever we played, uh, Will Parsons, who has been uh, a guest on the show before and who has uh, also uh, been been our you know guest GM and that sort of thing, uh, he he played a completely clean game of I'm going to earn money. Mm -hmm. And we played with the variant where after the end of age one, age two, and age three, you can buy victory points, just straight up buy them, and the price goes up. Uh, on turn two and then, and then in, in phase three, but he, he bought it and as a one-to-one -one at the end of the first age after the third turn. And he bought, I think it was like 31 victory points, just straight up. Everybody else was sitting at like 12 or two or whatever, for whatever they discovered, whatever they had, uh, you know, uh, done with their colonies, that kind of a thing. He had no colonies, but he had tons of victory points because he had decided to capitalize on everyone else's discoveries. That's the kind of game it is. So, it's different than resource management, though there is some resource management in it, in that it is straight up worker placement, but it is a beautifully elegant, beautifully clean, and beautifully sculpted, uh, the art for it is magnificent, a board game about uh, a cool, uh, very unique historical time that really, I think, teaches very, very well the need to plan mm. <laughs> what it is you're going to do, that it takes time to do it, and then act on your plan within the context of a very real living, breathing, limited resource community. Um, and so in that sense, I think, I think anybody who's in like sixth or eighth grade and, and studying that era should play Empire's Age of Discovery. Um, I think it would be a great resource for like history teachers. I really do. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then we like to talk about the other stuff. This past Friday, they released on Netflix, Castlevania, the TV series. Amazing. Was it, was it a good night for a curse? It was a, it was a great night for a curse. Um, I actually just had the chance to watch it this morning. And I watched the whole thing in one morning. How did I accomplish this? You're a time traveler. It's only four episodes. Four so episodes. four episodes. Half hour episodes. Half hour episodes. Okay. Um, and actually a little less than half hour, about 20, 25, 23 to 25 minutes. The standard TV format. Then. Standard TV format. So before yeah. we make fun of them, was that a good choice? Oh, yes, it was. Was it? But it actually feels, it almost feels like the way that, that they're structured is that it's more, it's more of a pilot movie. And uh, oh. let me explain this a little bit more before I get into that. Um, but essentially, this is almost, the, this is like the prologue and then the first parts of the story. And when I say story, I mean very specifically, they actually base it off of a particular Castlevania game. Oh, okay. Castlevania Three: Dracula's Curse for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And I didn't know it was going to be that way when I first started watching the series. So I see, I saw it was Trevor Belmont. He's the Belmont, the vampire hunter in the series. And I knew that Dracula was a part of it, of course. And I knew that Alucard was a part, Dracula's son. But I didn't put the connection together because I thought there's no way they're going to actually adapt the story from a video game. They're just going to take the world. I was wrong. Hmm. They did a, they, a very good job. So essentially what happens is the first episode, you don't even see Trevor until the end of a four-episode series. The first episode is actually all about Dracula 
and his wife and what happens with her. And that's actually taken from the backstory in the instruction manual for Castlevania Three. Wow. They did their homework. And so essentially, and this really isn't spoilers, it's the first episode, um, but essentially, and, and you would know this too, it's kind of like the, the inciting moment, if, as, as it were. Um, Lisa is her name, and she goes to visit Count Dracula, doesn't know him, and she basically tries to coax him um, out of his shell out of his castle and says, oh, there's so, like, there's, humanity has things to offer. I'm a woman of science. Um, let me help show you these things. And he's intrigued and he goes along with it. And then there's a time, time skip and she's being burnt at the stake. Ah, okay. Apparently that just went terribly. (laughs) Now, why was she being burnt at the stake? Of course, the implication and then, then the, the, um, the bishop who's kind of responsible for it. And this, by the way, this show is not very kind to the uh, Catholic church of this era. It takes place in 14, 1476, I believe. Mm. So um, very, a lot of them are very corrupt, I will say, which is actually the only thing that they completely changed from the video game. In the video game, you're basically told, Trevor's basically told, I should say, to stop Dracula by a priest. Mm-hmm. In this case, it's more like, nah, the priests are kind of the ones that started this whole thing, kicked it off by essentially burning her at the stake and then basically targeting the wrong people for the ones responsible. Good old witch hunt. Exactly. Um, but essentially what happens here is that Dracula is not, not there. He's not in the town at the time. He, he went off because, you know, remember, he, know, he doesn't live in his castle anymore. He travels the world. He acts like a, like a human being. He's, he's not violent or dangerous or anything he travels around he gets things for her she kind of they they have this relationship with science and yes they were married they were actually married and that's kind of alucard is the her son as well so it all kind of fits into it um so she gets burned at the stake and as she's being burned it's kind of an odd moment because it actually came across as um messianic a little bit more than perhaps they may have intended uh, but she's kind of yelling out, oh, don't punish them for what they've done. Like uh, she's being basically burnt at the stake. Uh, Father, comes, forgive them for they yeah, know not it, what they it, do. It comes across very <laughs> strongly that way. I was watching it and I'm like, is this intentional? Or, but anyway, it, it, it works in context. Um, and he returns and all of a sudden he finds that her house has been burnt down. And he goes to, to help to, to the town to help her. It's too late. She's literally she's ashes, but they're still doing the burning mm-hmm. ceremony. So he threatens that he's going to call um, demons from hell in one year. They have one, the town has one year to get their their stuff in order, basically to make peace with God, with whatever I think he says, peace with your God, before he's going to open up a hell portal and unleash hell on earth and destroy humanity for this. This is how angry he is, and they don't even take him seriously. And the very next scene that you see is Alucard trying to kill Dracula. And then we do another time skip. So it's really interesting. Of course, he doesn't succeed. Of course, hell is unleashed. But the fun part is that Trevor Belmont, who's really our hero of the story and the main character, you see him for a brief moment at the end of the first episode. He's just in a bar. You don't even know it's him until someone references the Belmont name, and he perks up. And you go, oh, okay. Now I see where we're going. And – but that's only – that was just episode one. There's only four episodes. So without giving anything away, what this does is – it takes the backstory of Castlevania Three from the instruction manual, and it takes the first few levels of the game. And for for those that may not have played Castlevania Three, it was the first Castlevania game in which you could switch between multiple characters. So you played as Trevor Belmont, the vampire hunter, Alucard, the vampire who has a sword and is Dracula's son, and Sifa, who is a, who is a monk that can cast spells, like kind of a or a priest that can cast spells. In this, they they call her a speaker which are basically like keepers of knowledge and they kind of they kind of rebrand her a little bit and there was actually another character as well which I don't think they're going to actually introduce but they they actually do a full scene from one of the early stage bosses in the game where you have to fight a cyclops to save Sifa who is you don't know her yet who is has been turned to stone by the cyclops and you have to rescue her and they play this whole scene it's a huge battle scene played out like a boss fight from the video game. That's it's, amazing. It's really cool. And uh, essentially by the end of this this series, it's a, it serves as a prologue for what could be a longer series. And by the end of it, he just, Trevor has assembled his team and they all have their different motivations, but they're all going to go after Count Dracula and kill him. Neat. It's a very violent show, I will say. I don't think it's gratuitous, but I will warn viewers, it's violent and it does have some cursing. Um, so I, just to let people know, Trevor does things like 
throws daggers, you know, through people, like into people's throats or something. He uses his whip to take out someone's eye or take off a finger, things like that. So it's it's definitely not a show that I would recommend for young children, but it is a really neat show, especially if you like Castlevania. If you're a fan of old style anime from, say, the late 80s, early 90s, like Vampire Hunter D, this feels very similar to that. Um, or if you're just a big Nintendo buff, or if you just like kind of, you like the idea of vampires and horror and gothic um, spaces, this is the show for you. Nice. Thanks, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and oh, they already confirmed season two. I uh, finished it. I was so happy. I'm like, I can't believe it. Only four episodes, really? And then I looked online. It's like, they already they already confirmed it. They renewed it because right after the show came out, it got a ton of positive praise. And so I'm sure they got a lot of views. And so I think they realized, oh, people actually do want to watch this show. Mm. And they ordered a full, I, what I'm hoping is a full season, not another four episode season. But it plays, it honestly, I would recommend watching all episodes back to back because it plays, it plays like a movie. Oh, okay. But I recommend it. It's time for War Stories. Tales of Tribulation and Triumph in Gaming. All right, so have you guys heard about this? The shortage that Nintendo is having, um, you know, getting enough supplies for the Switch. Mm -hmm. um, I the, still don't have one. Well, the, the Wall Street Journal and a few other sources like uh, BGR, even Kotaku, are saying that this is because of Apple. Um, as in iPhone, as in iPad, right? That Apple. Uh, they ruin everything. I know, right? Uh, nothing good ever came out of Apple, right? Uh, says Doc as he reads off his iPhone. Uh, as I read this <laughs> off my iPhone, yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, okay, so basically what it comes down to is, the short version is, demand for the iPhone 7, the upcoming iPhone 8. Uh, they're keeping parts, which are uh, parts that are also in the Switch, right? They're keeping the those makers at full capacity in the factories. And, you know, just general stuff like uh, NAND memory or LCD screens, um, data centers are wanting those. And so, um, you know, consoles, maybe you don't know, but uh, consoles kind of, they come out at a loss anyway. You know, we think it's a big deal that we pay 600 bucks for a console or whatever, but honestly, th that, that itself is um, not where they make their money. Where they make their money is on licensing for the games. Yeah. So whenever they sell these consoles at these costs, and it's been this way for like three or four generations, um, they're, they're literally losing money when they sell you an Xbox, right? Or a... Uh, uh, a PlayStation, or in this case, the new Nintendo. So they really can't outbid for that either. That's that's not going to solve the problem. So there have been some creative solutions, shall we say, by certain entities, uh, GameStop comes to mind, on, hey, we're going to pre-order this next wave. So one of the big news things is that actually the, the current wave that just got delivered, that just came out, um, like if you've bought one in the last few weeks is actually, um, wave two it's, it's wave two switch. So like the little problem with one of the, one of the joy con buttons that was happening, things like that has been fixed because it was a literally a different manufacturer that was handling different factory that was handling, putting that stuff together. They redesigned some specs and, and you literally have the version two. I almost always wait for version two or version three for any console. I am not a day one console guy. I've never have been probably never will be. Um, so I had this big garage sale three, four weeks ago and ended up selling some of my childhood Star Wars figures at a remarkably good price um, for, to a collector who happened by. And so I literally had the price of a Switch burning a hole in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And I went to GameStop and I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk in there and it's going to be magical. It's going to be like this, this moment and they're going to have one and I'm going to buy it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Cause that happens. And I walk in there and what do I see? I see a sign that says switch available now. And I walk up to the counter hesitantly and I'm like, okay, what are, are you serious? You actually have like one, and I look, and behind the counter, there like is one in a box, and it's like sitting there. And he's like, yes and no. And I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, we're taking pre orders. They're going to be coming on uh, by the 30th. So this was like the 30th of last month, right? 30th of, of June. And I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, you, you order now, you can pick which, uh, you know, box set you want, and then 
it will be mailed to your home. I'm like, what's the catch? He goes, totally no catch, but they're going fast. Mm. I literally have the money in my pocket. I'm like impulse buy doing this. I do it. So he scrolls through the computer screen saying, okay, you can get the Zelda one or you can get the arms one or you can get the, you know, I'm like, you had me at Zelda dude. And so what I'm imagining is the special, maybe you've seen the screenshots, the, the special black box Zelda edition. Yeah. Like the, the, the edition that is the packaged with Zelda. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's got like the silver Triforce on it, you know, and it comes with the pro controller. And did, did you get that set? Chris? No, I just got the Switch and I bought the game separately. Okay. Yeah. I, saw, I saw some extra swag that you had for I, I did get a collector's Zelda. edition, but it wasn't like the collector's edition. Okay. Um, the collector's edition had like a statue and stuff like that. I just got the one with the little right. map. And, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so Bob, not his real name, tells me that... Um, uh, not his real name is his real last name though. Um, <laughs> it, but, but Bob tells me, he's like, okay, so this is what you're totally going to get. And probably. And I was, what do you mean? Probably. He was like, well, we're not really sure what this means. What do you mean? You're not really sure. I don't care. I've already paid for it. It's coming to my house. You have my address, all this stuff. And, and, and he's like, yeah. So what you need to do is go to the website and put in this number and then you can get your tracking number. Cause I'm like a tracking number fiend when I have a tracking number. Um, I will sit around all day and every hour on the hour, like reload the page and see, Whoa, it's in Anaheim, you know? Oh my goodness. It made it to the Dallas distribution center. Woohoo. It's in my neighborhood. You know, that kind of thing. Um, that, I, I get great joy out of this for 10 days. I reloaded it and nothing, 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 nothing. And then finally, I think it was like on the 23rd, I get the email. Here is your uh, number for the Zelda DLC. Cause that was part of the package, right? Cause the DLC came out on the 30th. And right. so the whole thing was like, you're going to get this before the 30th and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, I have my DLC. Wait a minute. And it, it became this, like this crashing reality check for me. I just got the DLC number for a game I don't have on a system I don't have, which both of which are out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm supposed to be able to do this sort of pre-download thing, you know, load it all up. And I literally can't because this system that I don't, that I mm -hmm. own, that I've already paid for. And this was 10 days later. I am not saying I had buyer's remorse, but the, the adrenaline had worn off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I'm like, I want to play this, this full game. I do. I, I, this is stupid. This, this system has been out for a long time now by game terms. Uh, the game's been out for a while now. My friends are talking about it and I can't play this. There's, there's no excuse for this. This is frustrating. Mm -hmm. This is angering. And then I'm like, Oh good. I get to talk about it on the podcast. It'll be a war story. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So there is a happy ending to this and it's that on the 27th, not the 30th, the 27th, I watched the package as it actually did, uh, make its way into the Dallas distribution center and then into my, my local neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the guy came, but there were some things that were, I was told that were wrong. Um, game stop said they were handling the shipping themselves. Um, it was a UPS guy that showed up. And I'm not a huge UPS fan, but, um, you know, when the, when you say something like that, I imagine like the Amazon drivers, you know, how Amazon's doing that now where it's like, they have their own thing. They don't trust anybody. Right. They just, this guy shows up and he's like an Amazon delivery guy and they're really reliable. Um, and so I was imagining that, well, no, this was the, I mean, they literally delivered it at like eight 30 at night. And I hate that. I think because it's like the quote unquote end of the day delivery. Mm -hmm. And, and so I get the end of the day delivery and this guy shows up at eight 30 at night. And at that point I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to plug it in and I'm going to download, but I'm not playing this till tomorrow. You know, it all, it all came out well. It was a happy ending, but it was also the normal gray Joy-Con uh, package in the normal box with a Zelda shoved in there. And the DLC was emailed to me. And there was also a Pro Controller, which is very cool, but it was in its own box and it was in there and all that was in a box. And, and that all came from like Kentucky or something. And I don't know. It just seemed so we're here. We are in the 21st mm -hmm. century, all this digital stuff, all this amazing stuff, all this technology stuff. And we don't have the ability to make the things we want to make. We can't really get the distribution, right? Stuff is out, but not available. Something there's a disconnect somewhere. Yeah. And I know you were saying that, that, that Nintendo is having trouble getting these contracts. I know they take a loss on the system, but they need to get that system out there because even if you can't find the, the game in stores, now we have the ability to download games mm -hmm. to the system. Yeah. So, and, and that's for every system. And we, we've had that. 
and that's how they're going to make money. They're go- they're going to make yeah. even more money on that because they don't even have to print the game itself. And yet people can't do that because they can't get the system. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is a real problem. Yeah. So hopefully they will fix this because I do plan to get the system myself eventually, but I also don't want to, I'm not going to pay more than it than retail price. Right. I'm, I refuse to no, pay a scalper. And, nor should you. Uh, yeah. Um, but it really reminds me, me that, that we are still in the age of, uh, you know, the early automobile um, and the roads haven't been built yet. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're still at that place where we can do all this cool stuff with technology, but we can't get it out there to everybody right. at a reasonable price. And, you know, we can make all the food, but we can't distribute the food to the mm-hmm. poor people. You know what I'm saying? That's where, where we're at. Where, when are we going to have the drones that fly in and deliver the package to you? Exactly. You know? So well, this isn't even a delivery issue, though. It's a production issue. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. very true. Very, very true. And there's lots of problems with it. But the fact that they were still outsourcing to UPS when they told me they weren't, that I got the system that I didn't think I was going to get, that nobody quite knew. It was somebody somewhere is not talking to somebody. Did they at least include bubble wrap? Uh, it was the giant so the kids inflated. Can, the, the, the little kid can have some fun doing the pop. pop no, it was the big and, balloons. You get like four pops. Oh, in the that's not fun. Yeah, that's that's no fun. At least they're big pops. I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ian enjoyed those. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So speaking of the Switch, I actually uh, picked up a new game for it recently, ARMS. I actually picked up ARMS, uh, not because I was just dying to play it, but because we're on vacation uh, in my grandparents' house. And whenever we go there, typically a bunch of the family sort of shows up. And so in the past, for instance, like I brought my uh, Wii when we when that first came out and got everyone hooked on Wii bowling and all that sort of stuff. Um, we ended up playing. Uh, I remember at one point we had a tournament where we played uh, Wii boxing and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and so I was thinking like, OK, arms could kind of be like, you know, the the next version of that. Um, and unfortunately, things didn't work out there. We we didn't end up playing a ton of it. But my brother and I got to test it out. And. As I kind of suspected, it, it's one of those games that doesn't look super impressive just watching other people play it or watching the trailers. Uh, the concept's interesting, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't kind of strike you as this sort of like high intensity action packed thing. Um, but the feel is very good. And this is something you'd expect from Nintendo for the game feel to be very good. And typically, you know, Nintendo's game feel is always excellent, but you can kind of tell from the trailer that is the case. Uh, with arms, it's funny to me, at least, that you kind of had to just sort of have faith in Nintendo that that was going to be the case. Right. Now, let me ask you, because uh, we did, we went to a party, both of us did, mm-hmm. um, was it last week or week before? Mm-hmm. And At the time of recording. Yes, the we're, time we're of We're a little bit behind in releasing. Exactly. And uh, we did play arms. Mm-hmm. Um, and had you played arms was that the first time that you played ARMS? That was the first time I played okay. ARMS, and that's part of my point, is that when I tried that out, I wasn't super impressed by it because we were using pro controllers. That was my impression, too. Yeah. And, and also, I didn't have a lot of time with it either. Mm-hmm. And I got on, and I did okay. I mean, I did okay. Actually, I, Richard and I were playing, and Richard actually played it a lot more than the, than than. We everybody else did. He was like sitting there playing it for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I I won a I won a round. I mean, I lost the match, mm-hmm. but I felt like I was kind of learning the system. Yeah. But I also didn't feel like. I didn't feel that tight control feeling that I do for something like Super Smash Brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was my opinion. But then again, I didn't play it enough. I mean, mm-hmm. what would you say about the controls? Yeah, it's it's definitely a game that you need to play with the motion controls. I can really? see, like, I, I think you could learn possibly with motion controls. Like, this is at least what I'm thinking. Uh-huh. I might learn with the motion controls, understand the game, and then learn how to translate that to the pro controller. But the pro controller isn't nearly as intuitive. Um, it, it felt weird. When I was playing on the pro controller, and, they were, and I, I forget, someone was explaining the controls to me, mm-hmm. and... It was kind of confusing. I'm like, I have to do what to yeah. do this? I have to do what to do this? And, and, and that's that's the issue because you have like shoulder buttons and stuff to do it. Yeah. For weird. example, you don't actually um, move with the stick. When you're playing with the motion controls, you, they have what's called the thumbs up grip where you basically um, hold them. So like you're, you're kind of giving two thumbs up and you're actually pressing the trigger buttons in order to um, do things like jump or dash. Um, but otherwise what you're doing is you're like sort of tilting both in the same direction to move left or to move right, um, or to move forward or back. It's almost like joysticks. Hmm. Um, and then you actually throw almost punches. Almost like cons. Yes. Ah. Ah. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. Uh, but you, um, 
throw punches to throw punches uh and the angle at which you throw the punch like if you twist as you're throwing it that sort of thing is going to change the direction oh really you can tilt it as your as the arm is going out and that's why it moves so slowly is so that you can like affect the trajectory as it's going out that's really cool so um, so would you say that it works really well then I, the i'd say it control? does it takes a little bit of getting used to uh-huh. um, and i just i don't think i've still quite mastered it um so it's like it's one of those things where you as a player have to actually like get the feel for it in order to like be truly effective um but i mean i was able to jump in and like i played through the uh kind of the arcade mode the the grand prix as they call it um where you go through like 10 stages and you try to win the championship is that a single player it's a single player yeah. okay so it has both a single player and a multiplayer yes mode. it does um and then a single player mode i i went undefeated so i mean like you know even though i wasn't i didn't feel like i was a master yet i was good enough that i could sort of like pick up what i need to do and win the matches um and then my brother and i played a little bit and actually he tried the grand prix briefly wasn't super impressed um, I think because he felt like it was a little bit too easy. Um, but then we played uh, multiplayer. Then you're starting to get into each other's heads. And actually, it's really good in that regard. It's a nice, easy to pick up game where you're starting to think about what a lot of fighting game pros think about, which is like, you know, positioning and timing and what moves to use when. Um, it's a much simpler system, but one that I think works pretty effectively. So so with with Splatoon taking off so so much, for the Wii U and then having a sequel on the Switch. And it's become this new property that Nintendo's really capitalizing on it. It, it took it took off really well, and yeah. now it's like a Nintendo property. Mm-hmm. Splatoon 2 coming out later this month. Right. Yeah. So do you think that ARMS is in that same category, or is it just one of those, here's another weird Nintendo mm-hmm. game that came out that people like, but it's kind of niche? Yeah, you see, that's the tricky thing, is that I have a feeling that if, for example, like Splatoon 2 has kind of like that esport value to it. They didn't set out to make an esport, but it's it's again this entertaining enough to watch and it's got enough depth and strategy that people kind of can, you know, really mm-hmm. hone their skills and be really competitive with it and people can have fun watching it. Um even if it's not like the biggest thing. Like it's not Overwatch big, but you know, it's it's popular as an esport. Um ARMS, I think, especially because of that thing I talked about where it's more fun to play than to watch. Um the only people who I think are going to be interested in watching high level play are people that themselves have played arms. So I don't think it's going to be as big as Splatoon. Um, I could be wrong. I don't even but... mean from an esport perspective. Mm-hmm. I'm talking more about the popularity of a new game product. Oh, I see. I see. That's all. Just as an IP. Just as an IP. I think it'll be. I think it'll be kind of niche. Um, like, like arms characters. They're so popular, we're going to put them in the next Mario Kart. Yeah, yeah. That I d- kind of thing. I don't think that's going to happen. I could see an arms character showing up in Smash. Um, but I don't think they're going to be like, they're not going to stick like they did with the inklings, put them in Mario. I want strong bad. I'm just calling it now. I want, I want home star <laughs> runners, strong bad in arms. <laughs> He's already wear the right equipment. I mean, yeah, but the it. thing is though, he'd have to, everyone's got like some sort of gimmick for how they're able to stretch out. So for some people it's their hair. For some people it's like prosthetic arms. Like they've replaced their arms with these springs or whatever. Do you think they might get some sort of deal going with like Hasbro for stretch Armstrong? to get him in there <laughs> see now we're thinking yeah now we're thinking and and also clearly for strong bad it's his biting satire and wit mm-hmm. just <laughs> it just like the words sort of like fly out and hit them right, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> there's actually uh one character i think who wears like a backpack or something like that that uh has the extension the extensions oh, so that's interesting see yeah. I, I just assumed they were nintendo me's mm-hmm. you know the the whatever those things are called they're me's yeah and and that they just had stretchy arms for some reason. No. And I didn't realize it oh, was no. like an actual backstory and yeah, and, no, and it's and all, all and new characters and, and yeah. yeah, the art style is just totally different from oh. from that from the from the me. So That's it is crazy. its own its own art style it has its own presentation, its own new characters that they came out with. And I've noticed a lot of the characters are relatively popular from mm-hmm. what I've seen. Yeah, they're they're pretty iconic. I mean, it's they're, one they of those, look pretty different. I mean, it's yeah. easier to do that obviously when you just have you know a few characters like eight characters mm-hmm. as opposed to trying to have like thirty. Mm-hmm. It's one of those interesting things where whenever you come out with a new property, like the characters are all definitely distinct, but then um, it takes a while for them to sort of like be played and to have like a culture build around each of them before they really become iconic, if that Mm -hmm, makes sense. mm -hmm. Um, So like any new fighter that does that, like, I mean, even Overwatch, when you're sort of like first seeing the trailers, it's like, oh, these characters look interesting, but they don't really mean anything to you. Mm -hmm. And then you play Overwatch long enough that it's like, oh, yeah, all these characters like have like, you know, the memes surrounding them and like, you know, their backstories. And yeah, but it was marketed that way. It was marketed with the personality. Yeah, there was a push for that. It's just like arms. I didn't know was supposed to also be that i had no mm-hmm. idea you guys have educated me so that's interesting and now this week's meaty topic of discussion uh 
All right. So let's talk about design decisions again. Uh, this time, though, let's focus on the idea of conventions versus simulations. Now, what I mean by conventions is this. There's certain things when we play a game, we load a game up, um, that if we were looking at it completely literally, we might go, okay, that's just stupid. That's not how life works. Mm-hmm. Like I, a health bar. Yeah, a health bar. Great example. Right. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use a, an older example, Max Payne right? He gets shot like hundreds of times. And the way he deals with it is by taking painkillers, which in and of itself is this great, hilarious joke because his name is, is pain, right? But he, he just, he literally is just popping drugs and it's like, okay, I need more aspirin because I took a bullet wound mm-hmm. and then I'm fine, mm-hmm. right? Okay. That makes no sense. Or, none whatsoever. Or on the same note, like other games kind of have like their conventions. So it's like you eat food to restore health right. or like you pick up the first aid right. kit or but, something. But at least the first aid kit is used for healing mm-hmm. in real life to an extent. Mm-hmm. Like in Bioshock Infinite, you're just like digging food, trash out of like, you know, mm-hmm. food food out of like trash cans and eating that and suddenly it's healing you. Right. Or like in Fallout, you're literally drinking out of a toilet mm-hmm. and it heals uh-huh. you. Or let's just use a, a really recent example, um, Breath of the Wild, right? One of the big mechanics in it is you cook mm-hmm. and the food has all these different properties and you're fighting this big boss, right? A, a, a legendary of something. And, and you're like, oh, excuse me for a moment. I need to sit down and have this rather savory meal of rice <laughs> and <laughs> beef, uh, which I have uh, infused with herbs <laughs> and will no right you're just like munch 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 in the in the screen then you're back to the fight yeah okay so at least they have the munch 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 and it's not like skyrim where you just like literally just like mash a on 20 different foods that you ate apparently instantaneously instantaneously right (laughs) okay so my question i guess would would be framed this way is that okay is that okay and ultimately like what it's coming from is that you have the health mechanic of like i take enough damage that i die Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also, we want to implement a way for you to be able to restore that health. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on a purely mechanical sense, it is like the hit points going up and down and the ways in which you lose it and the ways in which you gain it back. Yeah. And what and, we've done you're is using we've attached, a strategy to, to attach to some mitigate, aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think yeah. part of that, there is, let me put it, let me put it this way and y'all might try to challenge me on this statement, but I don't think there are, or I will say, how about this? There are no video games that are full simulations, full accurate simulations of whatever they're trying to to be, like reality, essentially. Well, what about like a flight simulator from the early 80s? Well, you're not sitting inside a cockpit. You're oh, using okay. a keyboard, you're using a mouse. Even the controls themselves are different. You're not actually flipping buttons and, and pushing them yourself. There's no real haptic response there. You're just using your mouse to click on something. I, I thought you were hardcore, Jim, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but my, that's kind of my point. And even like, um, sure, you can have like things like a driving game in an arcade. Right. You've got the steering wheel, but... The way the pedals are set up is not really the same. Yeah, it's true. The, the, the gear shifts aren't the same. The se- and you're not also getting that same experience of you're driving really fast and you can feel it. And it's abstracted out. There is there is always going to be some abstraction. So the question mm-hmm. is when um, developers are designing their games, they have to kind of think, okay, what are we going to abstract out and what are we going to try to simulate and why? Mm-hmm. The why is the, mo- the, the very most important part, I think. Yeah. And I think – for, for something like a simulation, um, one of the companies that I feel has done an excellent job at that is Rockstar from uh, of Grand Theft Auto fame, most famously, because they're a company where they know that they're trying to simulate something real, like, for example, the city of Miami in the 1980s or the city of L.A. right now, mm-hmm. or they're going to simulate the Old West uh just as just as the trains are starting to show up, right? So yeah. they're simulating these these spaces that we know, and of course they ha- they inject tons of political satire. We all know that, but of course. but they but they still abstract it out. You know, if if you were going to make a real Los Angeles, and we talked about this in our scale mm-hmm. episode, um, it's going to take you quite some time to go from one side of the city to the other. Right. Plus, if you run a red light, and this is something that they do at every GTA, if you run a red light in real life, cops come after you. Yeah. Typically, if they huh. see you, they come out. They see you, right? Yeah. And even if they don't, somebody might run into you, that kind of thing. Um, and there's also red light cameras too, and they can try to, you know, right. send you a ticket in the mail or something. That doesn't happen in GTA. Yeah, our, our LA uh, listeners are like, well, you don't live in LA, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in in GTA, you can always you can always run red lights, run stop signs. You can you can swerve around traffic and go on the side of the road and stuff as long as you're not 
actively either running someone over right. or hit or you don't hit a cop car or no watch out if you ding a cop car they're going to come after you it's like five star rating product <laughs> um, they don't care if you ding somebody else's car just don't ding their car um, but but yeah so we abstract that out and they made that they made a decision at some point and they've stuck with that decision to say it's okay we're not going to have the cops aggro just because they run a red light. It's a design and decision. It's a design decision. They abstracted it out. So even in a game like that where they're trying to simulate. So there's there's even in those sort of games that, that are essentially you know a sa- an open world a sandbox and, there, and there's a simulation element to it, there's always a concession. And so the, the, mm-hmm. the idea here is where should that concession be? And I don't think there's one answer. I think it depends on the game. It depends on the game. And I think as we continue discussing this, we should probably be careful about the way we use the term abstract because I, I tend to define abstracting something as we are taking a, for example, restoring health. You pick up a med kit and it heals you instantly. What that's abstracting is the process of sitting down, applying first aid, and then getting back into the fight. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or even like, you know, eating food, like the process of like, say, going home, eating food, healing up, resting until your body has healed itself and then coming back. Those are abstractions of a longer process. Correct. Um, so when we're talking about whether or not, for example, with like, you know, running red lights, uh, you could say possibly that we're abstracting the criminal justice system. Yeah, that's what I, how, um, kind of what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that, that's more kind of like a a conscious omission of something. Right. Well, you could, I think for the actual abstraction part for mm-hmm. GTA, a better example of that would be the wanted level. Mm-hmm. Because that's kind of giving you some sort of an indicator of how much the cops are coming after you. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of an abstraction of like increased police presence based on what you've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you might also look at it in the framework of uh, willing suspension of disbelief. You've heard this term before. Mm -hmm. Usually it's in the sense of uh, watching a television show or reading a novel. And and you're like, yeah, okay, I, I, I get that that wouldn't really happen, but I'm going to allow my disbelief so that I can experience the story that I'm experiencing. Well, in video games, we're talking about very complex uh, ludonarrative systems, if I dare say that. And so the willing suspension of disbelief for certain systems, like, oh, I will pick an herb and I'll put it in my satchel. And when I need to heal, I will eat it. And that's good. And, and we'll just skip all the boring parts where I actually make camp and uh, actually heal up and, and, and I'm near death for three days. And that might make an interesting scene in like a movie one time, but it may be an interesting cut scene, but at the same time, it, it doesn't really work in the ebb and flow of an action game. Mm. And so that's a, a willing suspension of disbelief of, no, life doesn't work that way. Well, let's let's focus on that because I think you, you kind of hit on a, an important subject there. And when we're talking about an action game, um, you're trying to maintain a certain pacing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of, and I, I don't mean a story pacing. I mean the actual gameplay. Right. You're, you're, when you're designing, say, a game that you that you want to be action, you're the the gamer has an expectation of I'm going to, well, essentially I'm going to be involved in doing something that is either you know in some way competitive, whether it's competitive against another player or against the system itself. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't really matter. But if you were to do something like in the middle of it, you would fight one battle and then you'd have to stop and go off into a corner and take a nap for like five hours and you know eat some food and apply first aid and then you could get back up and now i can fight one more time Mm. and then do it all again that's probably not going to be a very successful game even though that is a lot more realistic Mm -hmm. for anyone that's tried to do any sort of um combat sports that's the other part of it too it's like how long can you go we most certainly give uh video game characters so much more credit when it comes to stamina in fact most games don't even bother with stamina Mm -hmm. you know and the ones that do they let you recover your stamina significantly faster than is actual po- actually possible. If you watch, for example, um, a boxing match, you've got two guys that are in you know, basically the best shape that you can possibly be, and they get in there, and they go, they go at it for a couple of minutes, and they sit down and rest for a minute, and they mm-hmm. get back up, and they go in there for another couple of minutes, and they're exhausted after each of these minutes. And assuming the fight goes the distance, they might be fighting for 15 of those rounds. Well, you add up that time, and you consider the breaks in between – it's not actually that long, mm-hmm. but it's unbelievably exhausting to the point yeah. that they and, and plus what they're putting their bodies through that they don't even have more than one fight in at the at the most they'll have like one fight every six months. Yeah. A lot of them it's like one fight every ten months or a year or more yeah. because of how stressful it is to the body. And yet in a video game, 
think about a boxing video game. It's just one opponent after the other. We're mm-hmm, good. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and not even a not even that, but an actual like a, like actual um, say like a game like Devil May Cry or a, another sort of action game Bayonetta. You're just out there constantly in constant motion attacking, and we just. We forgive that. That's our suspension of disbelief. Mm-hmm. And to your point about the pacing, you know, say, for example, you know, you don't want to have to heal yourself up uh, over time to get back into the fight in an action game. But say if you're doing a survivalist dungeon crawl where you've got a limited pool of health, health that you can't restore unless you make camp. And even then your score is skipping over the time like you do like a little time skip. But say like you make camp and then you take time to eat and heal and that sort of thing. And then your health is full when you get back at it. There's still a little bit of abstraction there. But, you know, it's closer to the real experience because what you're trying to simulate is the dungeon crawl. Right. And Or like a game like a survival horror game mm-hmm. where they like to focus on the slower pacing. And so for that, um, typically you're not able to just open up your inventory and eat some food really fast in the middle of a fight. They don't necessarily want you to do that. It might be a little bit of a slower process. Mm-hmm. Um so, so yeah, I mean, I think the genre is a big part of that and what you're, what sort of game that you're trying to make. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually want to pick on um, my predicted game of the year just a little bit. <laughs> uh, that was Horizon Zero Dawn. I will try not to gloat too much, Doc. I know. Because I actually called this. I know. But, <laughs> uh, well, part of it, admittedly, is I got really excited about it and shouldn't have. Um, just because anytime you get really excited about something, you're going to be disappointed. Good rule of thumb for life is just to set your expectations really low yeah. and be pleasantly surprised there you when go. they're exceeded. Um, for, 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 for life, for it's video such a games. a depressing attitude. Know, it truly is. <laughs> and, and any Star Wars film, just set your expectations really oh, low. Oh, that is so true. And then you'll be happy. Because because like with, with Seven, you know, I got really excited and I was very disappointed. Walked into the, the uh, uh, let's call it the prequel, um, and, and actually was like, hey, it's pretty good. And I don't mean the the, tri- the triple pre- prequels. I mean the, the recent one that came Rogue out. One. Rogue One, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was same experience i was like ah i was actually I'm not pretty, gonna like this oh i like it it's pretty good i, I was excited yeah. about rogue one i was actually not disappointed with that one so. well see but anyway <laughs> we're getting off yeah topic getting here. off topic <laughs> but the, the, i want to i want to talk about horizon zero dawn in the sense that um and, and we're going to do a longer show on this okay um we're going to do a full-on round table about this but uh just comparing it to zelda which i've finally been able to play now what with my 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 switch having finally come in the mail, yay! Uh, there's a lot of similarities. It's post-apocalyptic. It's adventury. Uh, you know, there's you're exploring a wilderness. You're, you're explore. It's the explorer's paradise. Yeah, you've got you've got to you to save the world in both of them. You know, all that stuff. But in Zelda, it's like, um, hey, you don't know anything, and you don't know what's happened. Go explore it and find out. And by the way, you're hearing a voice, and you don't know where it's coming from, and uh, you're gonna have to solve that mystery too. Horizon Zero Dawn does the exact same thing, except then as you go along, it it shoves everything into your face as, oh, and this explains this, and here's the backstory behind that, and that's because it connects to this, which is exactly about this, right? Okay, so so spoiler alert for Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, there's a moment where uh, uh, Aloy helps the Nora tribe fight off the eclipse, and then she enters the door beneath the Nora mountain. She finds a recording left behind by Gaia, revealing that the signal of unknown origin caused Hades to activate and seize control of her functions as a last resort. Gaia self-destructed to her own core to stop Hades, and without Gaia to maintain the terraforming process, the entire system began to break down and etc 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 that is a teeny tiny blurb from the synopsis which you're like wait what what and ultimately it comes down to this whenever you're playing a video game and you see five animals you're like it's a video game there's five animals Mm -hmm. but when the video game at the end of the video game says to you and here's the reason why you've only seen five animals you're like wait time out (laughs) Because what you realize is that everything in the game that was the uh, convention that you were just just accepting accepting as a convention, the game was expecting you to take it face value and be questioning and go, well, why are there only three types of plants? And why are those red plants everywhere? And how come just They're basically making excuses for their conventions, essentially. They they have a diegetic explanation for... Yes, but I mean, you can't expect because you have to you have to model all those animals. You have to animate and rig all those animals. You have to set them out, and you have to provide AI for those animals. And so it makes sense that you're not going to have, you know, every single type. You're going to pick a few animals. You're going to say these are the animals that we're going to have in our world. Uh huh. And the gamers are going to be okay with it because it's going to feel alive without having to have every possible piece of wildlife, particularly for an action game. Mm -hmm. 
Now, and, you as know, much, I'm, I'm actually intrigued by this idea. Like, I actually I like it when games try to sort of explain why it's this way in mm-hmm. this game, um, and that's a pretty holistic approach to saying like the entire world is this way because of something we've explained. But then you get to the parts where, like, okay, so we've explained all the conventions except for these, where somehow munching on this herb restores your yeah. your gut wound that you just took from a giant monster uh-huh. instantly. <laughs> you know. Well, and that's my point. Yeah, is that there's these moments where you're playing that game, Horizon, and you're like, oh, I'm totally playing a game right now, and it keeps reminding you that you're playing mm-hmm. a game. The thing is, while I've been playing Zelda. I've totally been playing a game and there's tons of conventions and it, and it, and it really is uh, an abstraction in that sense we were talking about before, but at not once. And I only think of this now because I'm thinking of it now meta, but not once while playing the game. Have I ever thought to myself, well, I'm totally playing a game and this game is reminding me that I'm playing a game. No, I was completely immersed in the experience the entire mm-hmm. time. And the irony is that they did that through less. Hmm. They did that through just, hey, we're not telling you where to go or what to do. The so-called quests, like like the very first quest you get is go beat Ganon. Right. How are you going to do that? Oh, I got to explore and figure it out. Any way you want. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing is, it's like, you can try to do it now, but ooh, you'll die. Yeah. You better be damn good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and there are speedrunners who've cleared the game. Who under an well, hour. sure. Yeah. But, but they also didn't do that on their first try either. Mm. They figured out what are the tips and the tricks to do That's this. Exactly and right. then they went and did it as, exactly as an extra right. challenge. Like the people that do the three heart challenges in earlier Legend of Zelda yeah. games. They learn the tricks and then they go do that. Mm-hmm. So I did a fun thing with my Switch. I actually installed the, the the child protection software onto it because eventually my kid will be playing it. Uh, but right now I'm the only one playing it. And so I'm watching my own tracking my own playtime mm-hmm. and I get an email at the end of the day on the app or whatever it is. And it's like, uh, yeah, you just played 10 hours. Today. Oh, gee, <laughs> did I really? Wow. So I have, I've literally played like 70 hours in a week, uh, of Zelda and I haven't done like all the towers. I haven't been to all the places. I've barely been anywhere twice except for like the two main villages. Yeah. It's really easy to do that in that it's game too. It's so amazing. It's also a huge, it's the world is huge. It's I mean, the world huge. is huge. And it, it made, Zero Dawn feel small. I had already complained about it feeling small, but it made it feel uh, small and insignificant. And I was sort of embarrassed, honestly. I was kind of embarrassed for Gorilla. I think they did a really great job on really lots of things. But if they had just not tried so hard and 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 taken a few more cues from Zelda, which wasn't out yet, and I know that, <laughs> then I think it would have been potentially a superior game. And, and not... Not to get too focused on on Horizon, we can maybe move on to other yeah, yeah. games and stuff after this. But I, I do think part of that might have been the marketing push from Sony, possibly pushing that idea that this is an open world game. When it's not really an open world game, it's an action game mm-hmm. that is in, that is set in a world that you can explore. But it's not really an open world game, and so you go into it with that expectation because it was it was basically marketed as open world. Yeah, and that's why you feel that way. Oh, it's small. Well, if if it wasn't presented that way, you're, you may not think that. Yeah. And so I would say that if we're looking at conventions and simulations as being sort of the X axis, right? You've got on one hand, you've got the conventions. And on the other hand, you've got the simulations. There's a Y axis too. And you could put on that Y axis something along the lines of uh, narrative and mechanics. And then what I would argue there is that there's a way to go overly simulationist in your narrative. And I think that that's an error of a different kind. Yeah. You see what I'm saying there? No, no, I, I agree because, and that's that's part of it too. We can talk about that some as well, but when you're playing, you're, you are playing a video game and we all accept that when we, when we load it up. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a, um, I'm not a badass space Marine. I'm not an elite um, military fighter. Uh, I don't know how to fly a fighter jet or a spaceship. I don't know how to box. Uh, these are things that like... I, I'm not a uh, round pink thing that can ingest things and steal their powers. Yeah, to go even more fantasy with it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like, you know, a, you know, an elf that carries around a sword and like, like slays monsters. You know, these are... We go in and we, ex, we, ex, we you know, suspend our disbelief about, about elements of ourself too. Right, and we're, right. the story needs to kind of reflect... Um, the story needs to kind of accept that and let us be the star. I mean, that's what you are. You're playing a character. You are the star. You are the hero, regardless, even if you're not doing something heroic, you mm-hmm. are the hero. You are the protagonist of the story. And so accept that, go with it, and don't necessarily get sidetracked by 
Um, we want to make sure that this story is, is, is very realistic. Like, honestly, it, go, it goes back to the GTA thing. It's this, there are elements of that story that are not realistic that may not happen that way in terms of the way that the, the, uh, the law or the criminal element might um, respond to some of the things you do in that game. Yeah. And, but that's okay because the game is not trying to say this is an accurate portrayal of the life of a criminal. No, it's not. It, it's trying to make certain political statements. Sure, it, it totally is. It is, it is re- reflecting reality. It is a satire of reality, but it's not trying to simulate reality. It has accepted the proper conventions of that, let's call it criminal narrative genre. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like crime stories as a genre. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, you wouldn't want to get bogged down with, uh, I need to see your license and registration, please. Yeah, cops, and cops never ask for your license and registration. No, they totally shoot first yeah. and ask if, questions if they, later. If cops are after you, they will kill you. Yeah, absolutely. Or they, they will immediately arrest you or kill you. They will never, you know, license and registration. Yeah. Come up and try to mace you. They don't use mace. No. They use guns. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about their greatest failure. Rockstar? Yes. So Grand Theft Auto 4? No, actually. <laughs> I would argue I was that, disappointed in it. I would argue that it's LA Noir. Oh, oh sure, definitely. Okay. And here's why. I think. This is my my opinion, my great manifesto on the failure of LA Noir, which I was really excited about and I played it and it was meh. Um they went too simulationist with the city itself. And they didn't realize, they didn't know what kind of game they were making. They, they, they went all in for creating GTA uh, LA uh, 1947, right? And, and they built this beautiful, beautiful world. And it was. It was detailed and beautiful and wonderful. And then they had you tell the stories in apartments and in little scenes and here and there. And they went to like a movie studio and there was a, a part where you're out of town in a little shack and there's like, you're in the sewers for a while. But when you're in the car, there's literally a skip drive button mm-hmm. so that you don't have to sit through the, the drive of this beautiful, wonderful simulation of, of 1947 LA. That was their great failure mm-hmm. is they didn't realize what game they were making when they made it. Yeah. And, no, I mean, I, I can, I can see that. And one could argue that like the, they had enough sort of like, sort of as you're driving along, you can sort of like spot this little situation that's going on. You can sort of pull over and do a thing at this place, uh, like a little, a little quick side mission sort of. Um, but there are probably other ways to work those side missions in. Uh, you could probably also argue that a lot of those you could just uh, omit from the game. Yeah. They were and just, useless. just basically have you go through like, Look, what you're supposed to do right now is drive to this person's house and investigate that house and interview this person. Mm-hmm. So just take me to that scene. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there are plenty of games that have done that. The problem is I think Rockstar knew that it did a thing really well, and that was simulate cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and it got so bogged down in that that it forgot that it it forgot what the conventions of noir were. Granted, it hadn't really played in noir, but I would also argue that all the GTAs are noir, technically. Mm. When, when you think about... They have some elements. I wouldn't say... I would say... The, you don't have the femme fatale is a big part mm. of it. Not really. I mean, you do sometimes have a, a female character. I mean, there are female characters, obviously, but I wouldn't really classify the ones that are the female characters in GTA as the classic femme fatale, which is considered a big part of that noir genre. Well, I didn't say classic noir. I would say modern noir. In right. the same sense that, say, Memento is noir. Right? They're, they're crime stories, the and film. they sort of focus on criminals who are believable people put in bad circumstances who turn to crime because yeah. of the circumstances. Right. I, I, yeah, would, yeah. I would say they're much more closely connected to the um, the, the mafia genre, like a subgenre, I guess, like like general... Godfather stuff. Yes, Godfather, Goodfellas. Organized crime. Scarface. Scarface, yeah. Those are like... They made that game. Yeah. Yeah, they made the Scarface game. It was terrible, time. but... <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, I think they're more focused on that as opposed to really the noir. I mean, aside from like some of the, some of the like darker elements to it mm-hmm. and maybe some of the black humor. Um, but yeah, so I, regardless, I mean... It's, they're cousins, they're yeah. cousins. But I guess my point is this. You gotta know what game you're making or or it won't work. And part of knowing what game you're making is knowing where you lie on that convention versus simulation spectrum. And I think it's a spectrum. It's not, it's not a black and white. Yes or no. It's not binary. And uh, to be fair, I did look it up because I I kind of suspected, but I just wanted to make sure. Jim doing research. Doing a little bit of research. Um, 
Rockstar didn't actually develop L.A. Noir. They just published it. That's true. It was developed by a third-party game developer called Team Bondi out of yeah, Australia. Yeah, I remember that. So it, I don't want to come down too harshly on Rockstar because it wasn't. they have more than one development team mm-hmm. as part of the Rockstar umbrella. Oh, yeah, but this wasn't even one of their development teams. It was actually another company that they sort of outsourced this. I mean, outsourced mm-hmm. is probably the wrong word. They just published their game. Yeah, the facial mapping technology that went into that game actually literally went out of business after yep. that because they, they bet so much on it and it just didn't pan out. But uh, yeah, that's true. I, I am making blanket statements about teams that aren't even really teams, but um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other examples that we could go to. Well, let's, let's maybe like take it back a little bit to the theoretical um, because I thought that occurred to me earlier is that there was a, a old professor of mine who talked about metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was actually kind of like an introduction to the arts and technology program as a whole. This was kind of like the philosophy of arts and technology almost. Okay. And so one of the things they said is that metaphors are very rarely accurate but they could also be useful. So right. something's not a metaphor if it is one-to-one what it is we're talking about. Maps are a good example. Uh, you have a map that is one-to-one scale with the world you're, you're portraying that's like all the same terrain mm-hmm. and everything like that. It's basically just the real world. It's representative, but it's yeah. not a metaphor. Exactly. Well, that makes sense. So, sure. And so what you're trying to find is the useful elements of the metaphor. We sort of accept that what I'm looking at is a bunch of lines on a piece of paper, but you know, it's a size that's easy for me to pull out in reference. And those lines can tell me what I need to know about key landmarks and their relation to each other. Um, but without, but like, you know, I, I'm still going to be looking at something totally different versus what I'm looking at on my map, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And so what you get into, and this is a uh, kind of Building on that and going in a slightly different direction, um, Ralph Coster's Theory of Fun, I've talked about before on the podcast many times. And if you haven't read that book, definitely go read it. Great example. It's a very, very good book. But one of the things they talk about there is Tetris. Tetris is one of those games that has pretty much no narrative explanation for its mechanics. It is... Mm -hmm. You have shapes. It's a pure puzzle game. Yeah, it's a pure puzzle game. Tetrads are people too, Jim. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Tetranomes. uh, Tetraminos. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Tetraminos. Is it Tetramino or Tetramino? I always, I've, I've always heard Tetramino. But. Tetramino, yeah. Mm. But before it was a Tetramino, it was a Tetrad. Just saying. Look it up. <laughs> Google it. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Coster points out is that adding some sort of narrative, adding some sort of skin, if you will, to uh-huh. Tetris would totally change the game. So say, for example, it's now a game about some revolts where you're trying to uh, shove a crowd of people, say a crowd of protesters, uh, into straight lines so that you can gun them down with your army or something like that. <laughs> That's a completely different yeah. game that changes yeah. like the way you perceive it, the context, uh, what your objective is. Um should you or should you not be feeling good about clearing these lines, that sort of thing. Um, and that's something that you have to consider when you're building these games that we're, we have to, you have to think about from the beginning, do I have an aesthetic that I'm attaching to these game mechanics? Mm-hmm. And if so, what is the aesthetic and why am I using that aesthetic? Why am I choosing this metaphor uh, for my abstractions? Right. And then the the other lesson there too, when it comes to Tetris is, you know, do you need to have a story at all? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, clearly, clearly the decision was made. No, we don't need a story for this no. game. Mm-hmm. So you have to think of not just do you, a, a lot of games do need a little bit of a story depending on what they're doing, but Mario, Zelda, well, sure. Some but of them, they need a basic story. So the kind of idea is like, like, do you need a story at all? And if so, how much do you need? Mm-hmm. And the answer to that question is always just enough, mm-hmm. like just the right amount. It's the kind plot of, of Mario is save the princess. Right. It's kind of a cop out, but the idea is like just enough to support the mechanics of your game. And like, yeah. like, the gameplay itself. So some gameplay wouldn't make sense if there was no context for it. Sure. Um, like take take shooters as an example. At their core, mechanically speaking, shooters are about movement and aim. It's about like where am I positioned relative to the enemy, and when I shoot my gun in this straight line, will that shot hit the enemy? Sure. Or whatever projectile but, it is that you have. But think about the difference between a shooter like um, Call of Duty mm-hmm. or the modern Wolfenstein games and Contra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or yeah, context radius, is everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, or, or even, much, even much less super, story. Much less you, story is my point. Even if you go super minimalist, just talking from like a mechanical perspective, like something like vector based. Sure. Like old school, like super old consoles where you kind of like have a tank. They still call it like a tank, even if it's like kind of a, a super futuristic laser tank yeah, or yeah. something like sure. that. Asteroids. But you, you are you are a triangle mm-hmm. and you are shooting at um 
oblong shapes that are kind of mm. circular. But the yeah, exactly. But like, there's just enough context to sort of explain the uh-huh. action. It's not purely like this. We are calling this game. I'll tell you, play, what, play game. Sure, you are triangle. Don't get hit by circles. But but how much would that game change if instead on the top of the cabinet on the arcade marquee it didn't say asteroids, it said cotton candy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You could just as easily look at those shapes and go, yeah, that kind of looks like cotton candy. Mm-hmm. And now you're you're shooting at cotton candy. You're not shooting at asteroids. Well, that was the entire Atari philosophy. You actually is shipped with pieces of paper you put over your screen. So, so that it, would, <laughs> it would change what it was you were doing with your one pixel. But um, no, no matter how hard I tried, I could not shoot that stupid dog. Oh, in and Duck Hunt. Duck oh, Hunt. Geez. Right? <laughs> That was good. And I think the plot of Duck Hunt was you're being mocked by a dog and you're taking it out on on, on a nature, right? Isn't that the plot? Isn't that the <laughs> you're, it's, story? It's, you're, you are a duck hunter and your, do- your loyal dog is there to help you out and collect all the ducks that you have killed. For some reason, you just eat a ton of dead ducks. I don't know because you're just constantly shooting them. Right. You don't stop after a couple um, isn't like that what ducks hunters are, typically do. Isn't that what Ducks Unlimited is all about? Just that are unlimited ducks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but then the, then the dog, they, they added that. I'm sure it's like a fun element where, oh, you fail? You had to shoot it. You didn't hit even a single duck? Okay, well, he's going to come up and laugh at you. He mocks you. And that becomes a story element of itself. But they don't need to add some sort of crazy, long, sinister backstory. Why does the dog hate you? You haven't been feeding him enough. You haven't been putting enough food in his bowl. He's resentful because he goes out and he helps you hunt these ducks. But you never actually let him share in the spoils of war. Yeah. You never let him try some of this duck. Do we need all that story in Duck Hunt? Of course not. And no. now, and then the, like, you're kind of getting to an interesting point where, like, if you're sort of looking at Duck Hunt as an art piece, there, you can sort of attach all this context and all this interpretation to totally. it. Totally afterward and like you know good art doesn't have to over explain itself well also the, the other thing i mean you could say how is your dog giggling how is it standing straight up and giggling because you've gone mad how does the dog pick up the duck by the neck and hold it with its with his hands mm-hmm. not his mouth not his mouth his hands his cartoon dog. he has opposable thumbs <laughs> is it really a dog or is it actually your hunter friend that's out there with you wearing a dog suit for some reason is it <laughs> yeah, wilfred is actually, it wilfred out there that actually makes a lot of sense john yeah, you wilfred. may have cracked the code there the so, duck hunt code <laughs> <laughs> but but we don't think about those things and that goes no. back to the conventions why don't we think about them because we accept as a convention that that he he is there as a means of displaying to you how many ducks you hit in that round mm-hmm. and I would argue equally, Duck Hunt is not about narrative conventions in that regard. Oh, no. It is about a simulationist approach to uh, a, a very new, for the time, revolutionary, for the time, uh, game okay, and, and, and way of playing a game. You shoot, I mean, you shoot at your TV with a thing. We were blown away, pun intended, mm-hmm. by how amazing this magic thing was. I brought it out of the box. I hooked it up and I shot at my TV and ducks fell out of the sky. And if it didn't work, the, the dog laughed at me. That is so amazing. I must have shot thousands and thousands and thousands of ducks as a 12 year old because of how realistic and simulationist mm-hmm. that was. Well, let's, while we're talking about older games, I kind of wanted to also discuss just briefly um, this, these conventions that we do forgive. And when are we willing to forgive them in older games? Because, um, just like going back to say, watch mm-hmm, like a, mm-hmm. a like a horror film from the 1950s, like a creature feature film. You're watching that movie and you're accepting the fact that okay, in the conventions of the time, they're going to be using like a big rubber suit for the monster, right? Of course, yeah. And it looks very fake, and we know it's fake. And compared to the modern special effects that we have and the makeup artists and the computer generated graphics, which are incredible, it sticks out like a sore thumb. But we can still take it seriously because, you know, that's the willing suspension of disbelief, too. We take mm-hmm. that seriously and we accept um, the conventions of that genre. And, of course, the plots tend to be relatively similar and that kind of thing. We won't go into you know, film theory or anything here. But um, when it comes to video games, something like Duck Hunt or Tetris, which are both um, very old games, both games from the 80s. I believe Tetris is from the 80s. Um, but they are games that are – that we still can go back and we can accept all of their conventions and there's no there's no issue there. That isn't always the case. I mean, do we is are there some games that you can think of that and I have one off the top of my head, by the way, that this might be a little content um contentious, but Ocarina, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask to an extent as well, the gameplay, the specifically the fighting mechanics of that game use certain conventions at the time that were possibly necessary because of the limitations of AI and processing power of the Nintendo 64. But I go back to play it now and it's very challenging 
to let that go. Not challenging isn't difficult for me to play. Challenging is in I don't I don't want to do it because I feel that it's too fake. When you have um, essentially enemies will, will if there's more than one enemy around, they will kind of surround you in a ring. Yes. And one will step forward and they might attack you and then I'll step back and another one will step forward and attack you and then I'll step back. Uh-huh. And which is why I'm still a little baffled when people will try to say, Ocarina of Time is the best game ever. Go back and play it. You're please. talking about Z targeting, basically? I'm talking about the way that the enemies attack you. Okay. Enemies attack you one at a time. They don't gang up on you. Yeah. Even when there are multiple enemies. And But they will sometimes come from multiple angles. Sure, but that doesn't that doesn't really matter with mm. Z targeting. You you can change your angle. You can yeah. change your perspective very quickly. It's not like, for example, um, Twilight Princess did a really good job of having enemies more complicated enemy AI, and they would try to corner you. You'd have, especially those, those like Lizalfos, I think they were, in, in some of the dungeons, where mm-hmm. they would come at, at you from behind and from different angles, and they would they would employ all these strategies. Obviously, Breath of the Wild does this, of course, to great effect. If you have a lot of enemies around you, they're just all going to come after you. I mean, they're not going to wait their turn to attack you. It almost feels like in, in um, Ocarina of Time that we're just, we are supposed to be okay with that convention of a one-at-a-time fight essentially a one at a time fight and once once and we could we could accept that at the time because we're wowed by the 3d graphics and the new perspective even though the earlier games in 2d didn't have that issue of Mm -hmm. course we could accept that at the time but now going back that is a convention that for me i'm not saying the game is terrible now or anything don't get me wrong but that's a convention that for me i cannot accept that convention anymore i cannot i cannot do it makes perfect sense we yeah we were learning the convention the new conventions, let's put it for that 3D. Way. For, yeah. for 3D, it was a new thing, and and the same, it was kind of it was happening simultaneously in Mario, um, as it was in Zelda, as it was in other games, and we were sort of learning. Well, what does it even mean? And and what about whenever we're in like a? I'm thinking like F Zero when you're in a car and you're oh, at yeah. a race. F Zero felt so fast and so good and so amazing and so streamlined. You go back and you play the original F Zero. It's clunky and it's bad. Um, it's you, can, so f- you can hardly see what's coming fun, but I'd much rather play a modern version. I would say the same thing about like the first Mario Kart, for example. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with you. And I think, but that's what it goes back to a lot of these. I mean, some of these games are still totally playable and we can accept the conventions. I mean, while we're sticking with Zelda, I, I completely believe that the original Legend of Zelda is completely playable. It has its own conventions, of mm-hmm. course, mm-hmm. but I feel that they still hold up and you can still accept them within the context of what you're playing, not just within the context of its time. I think it goes beyond that. Just like Tetris, I don't think you need to say, oh, within the context of its time, it's a good game. But, oh, there's a lot of problems with it. You don't say that about Tetris. And mm-hmm. I think there's there's plenty of games that we can point to that we don't need to say that. Um, here's another possible one that I think some people would argue, the original Super Mario Brothers. Now, I would disagree. But the controls of the original Super Mario Brothers, um, as you might recall, are quite different from later two-dimensional Mario games yeah, like are. Super Mario Bros. 2, 3. Um, I'm talking about the tightness of the controls, the way that Mario jumps. If you're very used – and and those were basically consistent after Super Mario Brothers 3. They basically all follow that same format mm-hmm. from Super Mario World all the way to um, – Oh geez, I forget the name of it, but the but some of the more recent like two D Mario games, mm-hmm. um, New Super Mario Bros. Thank you, series. New Super Mario Bros. Thank you. Um, but it follows those same conventions in terms of the general floatiness of Mario, the general way that he does a jump, generally how long he can jump, how far he can jump, how high he can jump. Yeah. But in the first Super Mario Brothers, it's very different to the point that it could actually be very difficult to go back and play that game if you're not used to it. You kind of have to relearn that system. It's true. And I honestly, I don't think it's bad, but I have cert- I have actually read some arguments from, uh, I don't think I could find them right now, but from people that say the mechanics of that game make it almost unplayable today, or at least at least unplayable in the sense of it's a convention that they don't want to accept. Mm-hmm. They feel like, okay, I need to play this game with different controls. And if you notice with Mario Maker, Nintendo made a decision Mar- with Mario Maker for Wii U. I don't know if you've played it, but in Mario Maker, when you build Mario levels... And then you play them. Either you play your own or you play the ones Nintendo gave you or you play the ones that other people made. And you get to choose the skin of the game. So you get to choose from Super Mario, original Mario 1 or Mario 3 or Mario World or new Super Mario Bros. It's all 2D, Mm -hmm. but they all have the same mechanics. Now, what does that mean? When you play the Super Mario Brothers 1 version with the graphics, it's going to mechanically play the exact same way as all the others, which will feel 
pretty different in terms of movement at least now that that's exactly said, what i'm referring to is movement. yeah that's exactly what i'm referring there are, to they do add the other mechanics like for example once you get to super mario bros you can do the spin jump yes um, they add once the, you get to the new correct. you can do wall jumps that yes, sort of thing they add they add the extra little pieces of like 2d mario you, you very and very good distinction there mm-hmm. they add the extra little pieces of mario that you couldn't do in some of the earlier games yes but it comes to um movement but also things like how high do you jump how far do you jump these mm-hmm. things don't really change but you're right they add the extra the extra features you mm-hmm. could say and i feel like this kind of brings us full circle to the 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 heart of the discussion ultimately is that you know we've kind of innovated on mechanics over time we've improved things as the hardware's improved we've we've improved as our our game design sense has improved we've become better as game designers and game developers um understanding what works what doesn't work etc and so there's some conventions that we've stuck to because it's kind of like a don't fix what's not broken sort of thing um and so how do we when we're deciding how we're going to design our game, what, medica- what mechanics we're going to use, what metaphors we're going to use. Um, what, what's the thought process behind deciding which conventions we're going to continue using because they work and they're not broken or which we need to evolve, which we need to abandon, which we need to completely come up with something new um, in order to get across what we're trying to get across in our game. I think part of that goes into experimentation and how much you're willing to experiment because um, – I don't, I don't I won't go too far off down the the, the near automata route but I feel like there was a lot of experimentation in that game less so with the way that it con- the way the controls worked but the way the game was presented to you in the sense of there wasn't just it is an over the shoulder action game camera right the way the camera yeah. the camera camera kind of plays with you and your controls change when you're in like when you're in ship mode versus um, the character mode versus mm-hmm. when you're in you're, you're hacking someone that kind of thing you have like almost like there's multiple different games within one game and it and it worked it was an experiment it worked but that's sort of challenging some of these conventions that that like you were saying chris had been established no you're going to do this style of game mm-hmm. um so i think there's something to be said for experimentation but obviously it's risky one of the best things to do in my opinion still is to go back to older games and see what works. Play it for yourself. Mm. These are cultural cultural artifacts. So a game that you might play and say, let's say, uh, The Goonies 2 for the NES, <laughs> right? I think that game is horribly unplayable today, in my opinion. I know some people still like it. I think a lot of that is nostalgia. But at the time, it did some very interesting things. It experimented. Some some elements of it were kind of similar to Metroid in terms of exploration and what they did. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, controls-wise and generally the way the game is structured, it's very much a, here's what we should not do in a modern game that might have this similar kind of retro feel. Don't do this. It's one of those kind of games. It was interesting for its time. It's a cultural artifact, but you can learn from it. And that's that's important to remember too, is that you know we have we have all these games, like you're saying, years and years and years of experience trying to hone two D two D mechanics and three D three D mechanics and what what is the three D platformer and what is the the two D shoot 'em up and these are all you know genres and things that we've done and, and sometimes you know a, generally a new one kind of comes along and like new sort of style and presentation, but we've kind of tapped a lot of these these wells at this point, and now it's just refinement and. You sh- nobody should feel like they need to go off on a silo and say, I'm going to ignore the earlier things. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you also don't want to say, okay, I know all these conventions from this genre. I'm just going to stick with these conventions. You also have to think what's going to work within my game, what fits within the game I'm trying to make. If I'm going to break this convention, I need a reason to break this convention. Yeah. I don't want to do it just to break it because mm-hmm. if I do that, I'm going to end up making a bad game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, yeah. if, now, if the and like to your point, you know, you need the reason if the point of your game is that like I'm making a standard shooter, but right. And exactly. the game's about right. that, but then Bioshock, mm-hmm. that's exactly how Bioshock was created. It's it's going to be a, a first person shooter, but mm-hmm. and then all the things we think of as being classic Bioshock elements were the but. Mm-hmm. Um, my answer to your question, the way that I would respond to that is um, stick with the stuff that works until you need something new. Mm-hmm. And whatever you do, don't shove stuff in because you're making a video game. Mm-hmm. In other words, think of it as a set of tools, a toolbox to pull from, but don't pull from, because every toolbox needs a hammer. I've got to put hammers in, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Maybe you don't need a hammer, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you're building with Legos. And you probably don't want to use a hammer on Legos. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So where where I would come at from that question is, um, we've never had Switch before. 
But Switch, if you remember the original presentation, the whole thing about it was, hey, we learned from every system we've ever done and incorporated some element Mm -hmm. into this system here. And now they've got a whole series of games where you're not even looking at the screen. You're looking at each other. What? That's a new convention. It's kind of messing with us. Mm -hmm. But that's something that moving forward, we will now have in our toolbox. And that in and of itself is fantastic, but they also made a Zelda. And what did they do with Zelda? They pulled all the best Zelda-ness they've ever had into one game without going, look, it's a game and we need to shove this in because it's a game. And it totally works if you're playing it mobile, if you're playing it on your TV, if you're playing with the Joy-Cons, if you're playing with a pro controller, it, it's sort of like it adapts to, to any of that. And something that you should definitely go watch if you haven't seen it is the, I think it's like a three part series of the developers talking about the making of breath of the wild. Oh yeah. Um, and it's really to. fascinating to hear them talk about, um, the process of like, we're going to reconsider everything. What about Zelda? Do we want to keep? What about it? Do we want to change? Nice. And they, they made very deliberate decisions about like, okay, this is a convention of Zelda that we definitely want to keep. This is a convention of Zelda that we don't necessarily need for this. So let's try something new. Yeah. And, uh, that, that process of sort of, um, Going through that with each of the mechanics, each of the nice. elements of the game kind of led to what we have. Jim, we need to tweet that out. Yeah, I've I've, I've watched that. It's, it is very interesting. Cool. I need to watch it. And they, I think tweet they, it out so it I'll watch it because <laughs> I, I, I never it. I never read any of the show notes or anything. Yeah. So I I only read the stuff that Jim tweets. <laughs> but yeah. it's I mean yeah it's it's really interesting because they really did. I mean it was just like nothing was was off the table, mm-hmm. which is which I think is something that you can do. Um, but you have to know, again, you have to, you have to know what you're doing too, yeah. because that could be really dangerous yeah, no potentially. Kidding. No kidding. So that was kind of a big risk in itself to take that kind of approach. Mm-hmm. 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 So breath of the wild is an example of it done very well. There are cases, and this is something that we've talked about before, kind of in different ways, but I've talked before about, uh, hit makers and how, um, in that book, they're talking about that neophobic neophilic. And they're going through and talking about like, you need enough of the familiar to appeal to people and to not alienate them. Because if it's something is completely new, it's alien, people don't get it, they're turned off by it. You need to sort of introduce the new that they'll like by keeping enough of the familiar that they're comfortable with and familiar with and can sort of build from there. Yeah. Well said. Well, thank you, Backward Compatible listeners, for joining us for episode 106 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussions on conventions versus simulations. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. And we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.